Thank you. Well, it's great to be here with you all this morning, um, as it has been this whole time. Thank you to Neiman and to all of you for welcoming me into your midst. It's been super fun to get to know some of you. So my coordinates are up here on my website, climatecommunication.org. Follow me on Twitter, at climatecoms, with two Ms. And so I thought we'd start with this. <laughs> I just found it yesterday, and I thought it was really funny. I thought you all would enjoy it. <laughs> So I'm going to start off with very quickly mentioning three areas where I think we could use some improvement in the coverage of climate change. So, well, I was too quick there, sorry. <laughs> the amount of coverage, right? I know that all of us in this room, we're in a bubble. We think there's tons of climate change coverage, but most Americans, and we've surveyed this, my colleagues Ed Maybach, at George Mason, and Tony Leisowitz at Yale have surveyed this. Most Americans don't hear about climate change in the news even once a month. They are not hearing about it, and this is the most important story of our time. The topics and the framing, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and the connecting the dots between climate change and extreme weather, and between other things we're experiencing and climate change. These are three areas I think we could use a little improvement. So first, the amount of coverage. As I mentioned, there's just not as much as we think in the bubble that we live in. And you know, it's an important issue. I know there are other important issues. <laughs> so right after a big climate extinction report came out, this is what the coverage looked like. The royal baby got tons of coverage. So when people tell me, oh, there's so many important things happening in the news, we can't constantly report on climate change, I think, you know, priorities, folks. And then I mentioned the topics, right? So what topics do we talk about? Climate change generally is an environment issue or a science issue, or in the, in the television industry, it's largely a political issue. So here's the coverage in 2017 on the nightly news shows, ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox. 85, is, it's almost all about what the Trump administration said or did, and not very much about all these other things about climate change that are so important, from national security to public health. And here's more examples. So it's not just, uh, yeah, so in, in the coverage of these hurricanes, Trump discussed in 60% climate change only in 5% out of 1,500 stories on these hurricanes. Now, another issue with the topics and the framing, a lot of attention to the problem, not very much to solutions. And you all remember Elizabeth Arnold. She was on NPR. She's, uh, when she was, she's up in Alaska now teaching. And when she was a Shorenstein fellow, she wrote this piece, Doom and Gloom, the role of the media in public disengagement on climate change. Her point being that if you tell people about the problem, but you don't tell them what to do about it, and you don't tell them what people are doing about it, it will, can cause them to just disengage. Too much, can't take it. And so she actually calls out the media for having a role in that public disengagement. So you've heard this now from a lot of people, more focus on solutions. And so my friend and colleague Ed Maybach likes to say, the secret of good communication is simple, clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted sources. You have now heard from a lot of people, we need more coverage of solutions. And we saw some really cool ideas yesterday, I thought. So I mentioned the third thing I feel like we need to improve our coverage on, it's the linkages between climate change and extreme weather. Okay, now this is most, this is television, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, and PBS. The links made between climate change and extreme weather. Tons of coverage of extreme weather, but almost nobody's making the linkages, with the exception of PBS doing a little bit better. These, all, these studies all are from Media Matters for America. But, and yeah, here's, here's another one from hurricanes like Florence. Almost no connections to climate change being made. And it's not only television. This is newspaper coverage. Top 50 newspapers in the US. Only 7.5% of the articles on Hurricane Florence mentioned climate change, and even worse on television. How about fires? Do we do any better on fires? Not so much. So this is last year's wildfire season. The blue is the wildfire segments, and the red are those that mention climate change. And then I thought, well, maybe this year was better. So we just got the data hot off the press from this year, October 21 to November 1st. This is a period that just ended, where we've had horrific fires. In blue, all the wildfire segments. In red, those that mention climate change. So a lot of room for improvement. But I'm going to give you some tools to improve on this. So 
Now I'm, I'm done, the scolding part is over, and I think there's really great coverage going on. I wanna say, actually, there's, I mean, uh, Rebecca Hersher at NPR does amazing coverage. We have some rock stars right in this room, Lisa Friedman at the New York Times, Emily Holden at The Guardian, Emily Atkin at Heated, Alex Harris at the uh, Miami Herald, Mary Landers at the Savannah Morning News. We've got some rock stars that are doing great climate coverage, connecting the dots, telling local climate stories that matter to people. And I'm sorry I didn't mention everybody in the room, but those are some of my favorites. <laughs> so I'm hoping that we have turned a corner and that we are now in a new day for journalism around climate change. And I hope you are all gonna be part of that new day and that new wave. So you probably know about the Covering Climate Now initiative. Over 240 media outlets with a combined audience of over a billion people taking part in this effort. The first big push of this effort was a week of intense climate coverage in September. And even Media Matters for America, who tends to be very scolding of the media, commented that the coverage during that week was excellent. And now we just have to hope that it continues and that it wasn't just a flash in the pan. And they mention, of course, that the broadcast TV news should take note. <laughs> and we are even seeing improvements in television. If you would have told me a year ago that CNN was gonna host seven hours of primetime coverage of a town hall on climate change, I would not have believed you. This is something I think is super important. I've been harping on the images that are chosen to illustrate climate change stories for decades. And I'm so thrilled that The Guardian just came out with this new, this new guidance about the kinds of pictures that we choose. So think about this. I know I can't be the only one who notices. There's a story about heat wave, right? Heat waves are deadly. And what is the picture that they used to illustrate it? Kids playing in a fountain, having a great time, or people sunbathing on the beach. This, the pictures that we choose to illustrate stories about climate change are just terrible for the most part. And they don't illustrate the human impact at all. And they don't often illustrate the solutions very well. So I think this is actually a very serious issue. And of course, the other thing is that you might see a polar bear, which is also not a very good way. It's distancing for people. So this, and there's a great project called Climate Visuals out of a group in the UK called Climate Outreach, give you some ideas on the photo side, the image side of this story. Of course, Greta has been getting great coverage. She's easy to cover, right? She's, it's a wonderful story, but not just her, the climate strikes. I mean, I have always despaired at how climate protests have been covered. There'll be so many people in the streets and there's no coverage almost. This time it was different. The coverage of the climate strikes was really pretty remarkable. Even the big TV networks, all of them had at least one segment on the climate strikes on both their AM and PM news. MSNBC had 22 segments on them the day of. Fox News even had 15 segments. Mostly they were belittling the strikes and climate change, but they did them, they covered it. And even newspapers of the top 50 US newspapers, 36 featured the strikes on the front page with 47 of the 50 producing original reporting. So I felt like this was really an improvement, real turnaround. And in other climate change coverage news, NBC has launched a new climate unit. They just did a week long series. CNN, brands, so even though they're picking up on this term climate crisis and they're using it and they've got a chief climate correspondent, CBS is running Eyes on Earth segment, Eye on Earth. And a senior VP at NBC said, we're not just gonna do a week on this, this is the biggest story of our time. So this makes me really happy because I've been waiting for 20 years at least to hear somebody say those words and it truly is. So, Okay, enough about coverage in you know, reporting what most of you probably already know. Let me just talk a little bit about my thoughts about strategy. I feel like it's really important to help people understand both the threat and the opportunity. It's both the worry and the hope. That's the whole story. And I think we need both. You all know this, but I also picked some good pictures that I thought really are the kinds of images that we should be using to illustrate this. Not a problem for the future, here and now, affecting all of us in our own lives, where we live, where we work. And so often, and I'll start getting into my language issues, because I've focused for 30 years on the language that we use to talk about climate change. People, and we've heard it a lot in here, talking about saving the planet. It's not about saving the planet. It's about us. It's about the conditions for human life on Earth and civilization as we know it. So 
not about the Earth, the planet, the environment, and polar bears. Of course, it's about those things, too. Don't get me wrong. But it's about us. It's about people, our economy, and our way of life. Now, I am a big fan of this notion that words matter. So I'm going to give you a few thoughts. And what I'm trying to do here is not give you a do's and don'ts list. I'm trying to sensitize you to these issues so that when these kinds of words come up, not only these words, but other words, you'll think about this and you know, really carefully consider it. So many stories I see say, the world's warming and we're to blame. It's our fault. And when I hear the words blame and fault, I recoil a little bit. It's very, it can make people defensive. Now, sure, we're the cause. It's our responsibility. Cause and responsibility are fine. They're much more neutral words. Blame and fault are not very neutral words. And I think that it has an effect, an emotional impact, on people when we say words like that. Inevitability. And it's not just the word inevitability. So many stories I read say, no matter what we do, da 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 da. So that is a, no matter what we do, we're screwed. That's a really bad framing. And I think, first of all, it's not true. Second of all, it's very disengaging for people. So I like to talk about choice, the choice we face. Yes, there is a certain amount of warming already in the pipeline because of the emissions we've already produced. But the future's in our hands. Whether we get a little more warming or a lot more warming depends on our emissions. So it's about our choice. And there's an urgency to action. This isn't like steel tariffs. If we don't get it done this year, we can get it done next year. Every day we, com we keep going down this road. We're committing ourselves to more and more future warming. So there's an urgency to this. Belief. How often do we all hear people talking about whether you believe in global warming or not? I'm sure you all know this. This is not a matter of belief. It's a matter of evidence and facts. So I never use the word belief. I don't use the word opinion. I, I don't use the word think, scientists think X. So the way that I talk about the scientific consensus on climate change is with tested language. And the language goes like this. Based on the evidence, more than 97% of climate experts have concluded that human-caused global warming is happening. That is language that puts it in the right frame. It's evidence. It's about evidence and facts. They have concluded this. They don't think it. It's not their opinion. It's not agreement. It's not any of that, right? And so my colleague Ed Maybach tested this language. Based on the evidence, more than 97% of climate experts have concluded that human-caused global warming is happening. Retreat. This is a word that I'm hearing a lot of lately. And it's, I know, I may get some pushback on this, but it's okay, I'm just gonna tell you what I think. Americans don't retreat. We don't like the idea of retreating. It's a very negative, has very negative connotations, right? Even in the military, they say, we never retreat. We just advance in another direction. <laughs> so maybe we have to advance inland, relocate. We can relocate. That's not the same as retreat. Retreat is so, nobody wants to retreat. So we relocate. We move, we relocate to advancement zones and higher ground. I don't know the exact right answer to this, but I know that there's, to me, a problem with the word retreat. Nuisance, we've heard a lot about nuisance flooding. Oh, it's just a nuisance. It's a lot more than a nuisance. It's costing huge amounts of money, right? Businesses are suffering. All of this stuff is going on. So just because the scientists use a word, just because that's their term of art, nuisance flooding, you don't have to use it. You don't have to pick it up. Or you can say, so that the scientists call this nuisance flooding, but it's a lot more than a nuisance. Here's what it's doing. Here are the costs. So again, I can't go through, I mean, I could talk about this stuff all day, as you can probably see. But I don't have time to go through all of the words that you know, worry me when I see them. I just want to sensitize you to this so that when you think about this and when you're writing, it will come to your mind. And I will be sitting on your shoulder reminding you about all of these kinds of things. So there are so many more. I mean, we started a conversation yesterday that we can maybe pick up again about climate crisis and climate emergency. You all heard me say I think climate disruption is a really good neutral term that describes what's going on. But I also did hear somebody say, and I thought they were right, we now sometimes use the word disruptive or disruption in a positive sense, as in something, yeah, so that's a little bit of a problem. But. 
maybe a minor one. Okay, so now I want to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is words that mean entirely different things to scientists than you do to the public. And the reason it's important to talk to you about this is because I so often now I'm seeing journalists pick up on the language that scientists use and just using it without thinking about how your audience is going to perceive it. So here's a great example is the word aerosol. Okay, when the public hears aerosol, they think spray can, period. That's all they think. Scientists don't mean spray can. When they say aerosol, they mean tiny particles in the atmosphere, like the sulfate aerosols we get from burning coal, which actually have a short-term cooling effect on the climate. And so that's Rush Limbaugh. He read the story that said aerosols are cooling the climate. So he's doing his part for global warming by spraying aerosols on the globe. Okay, so you need to say tiny particles from coal burning or tree burning or whatever it is, but don't just repeat the term that the scientist has used because it means something different to your audience. And there's a lot of these, positive feedback, right? Everybody knows what positive feedback is. It's a good thing. You do a good job, you get positive feedback. Well, in the climate system, not so much. It's a way that global warming feeds on itself, where warming causes more warming. So say vicious cycle. Whenever I've explained positive feedback to a person, they say, oh, you mean a vicious cycle. So I just started saying vicious cycle. Or if that sounds too vicious, you can just say feedback or something, right? So positive to the public is good. Negative is bad. So when you talk about a positive trend in temperature, it sounds like a good thing, but it's not, right? Or enhance. Scientists use enhance to mean increase. But you know, you be, when, when most people hear enhance, they think to make better, as in enhance your appearance. So we talk about the enhanced greenhouse effect, it sounds like a good thing. Oh good, new and improved. Or enhanced hurricane activity, sounds like a good thing, but it's not. So I've come up with 150 of these words. This is just a few of them. You don't have to write them all down, but this will give you just a taste. This isn't an article I wrote in physics today. You can download this from my website, climatecommunication.org. You can also, if you follow me on Twitter, this is a pinned tweet with this table of words. And I, I'll just point out one or two of them. And this is only a small sampling of my larger list of 150 words. <laughs> you know how I get these? I go to the meetings of scientists, and I listen to their talks. And I go, oh, there's one. Oh, there's one. And I just keep And for 30 years of doing that, I've got 150 of them. And it's not just in climate, by the way. It's in a lot of fields. But so I'll just point out one or two. So. Theory is really important, okay? Scientists talk about a theory as something that's very well established in science and can be used to make predictions, like the theory of gravity. But to the public, a theory is just a hunch or a guess, so that's just some theory. So you don't want it, you want to be really careful in using that, even if a scientist uses it. If you use it, you're misleading your audience about the strength of the evidence. Another one I love is error. You probably, if you talk to scientists, you've heard them talk about standard errors and error bars and all that. What they mean, the public error is just wrong, right? But what the scientist means is it's this range around a particular measurement, they'll call those the error bars. I've been telling the scientists this stuff for years. Sometimes they listen to me, sometimes they don't. But I think when I retire, I'm gonna open up a tavern for scientists and I'm gonna call it the error bar. <laughs> so more on words. I have thought a lot about this linkage between climate change and extreme weather events and the way we talk about them. One of the things that bothers me is that we still call them natural disasters. And so I call them unnatural disasters because climate change is now influencing every weather event. We have changed the background conditions in which every weather event occurs. It's warmer, it's moister, the sea levels are higher, we're getting heavier rainfall. All of those things make a difference in every weather event that occurs. So I call them unnatural disasters. This is another paper I wrote. So at my website, climatecommunication.org, under resources, under articles, you can download this and any of the other articles I'm mentioning. It's also a good place for lots of other resources I collect and curate from other places as well. So one of the things I've developed recently that I think will be really useful to you in connecting the dots, like I told you, I'm not just gonna beat you up for not doing it. I wanna give you resources so you can do it more easily. I developed these with Scilline, which is a project of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And what we did was we put together quick facts. We researched these heavily. We went into the deep into the scientific literature. So all the papers that show the connections between any particular type of weather event and climate change. We give you the references, we talk you really through this, very simple, very clear, you can read the entire thing in five minutes, 
And if you want to go check on the references, great. They're all right there for you. All you have to do is click on them. You can go read those papers for yourself. A lot of journalists don't have the time or the inclination to read you know, a dozen papers in the peer-reviewed literature and go to every assessment. But we've done that for you. And we've done them on hurricanes, torrential rain and flooding, heat waves, and wildfires so far. And we're working on one on cold snaps. I got started on it, and then I got overtaken by events, and we didn't, I didn't get to get it out in time. But we're, we'll get that one out and another one on drought. And so we're going to keep doing these. And this is sort of what it looks like. You get a top line message. You get a bunch of facts. This is for, in this case, there are 10 facts. And they're all referenced. We give you some accessible experts who have agreed to be contacted by reporters with further questions. These are people publishing actively on these linkages. We give you pitfalls to avoid. And we make it all really quick and easy for you. Because look, I know what your jobs are like. They're hard. You're working fast. In fact, one of the things that we did in our program that Sean and I are talking about today, Climate Matters in the Newsroom, we surveyed journalists. Some of you may have taken our surveys. We surveyed all the members of SEJ, RTDNA, NABJ, and NAHJ. And we asked them about their climate reporting. What are the barriers? What do you need? What's... We heard them say over and over again, I don't have enough time. I, you know, to do all this. I don't, I don't feel confident enough in the science. I don't have good role models. I don't have the graphic support that I need. I don't, you know, whatever, all of those things. You know, not enough space in the news hole. We've designed our whole program to address those barriers, to help you, to provide you with the things that you need, to make your job easier. That's another thing my colleague Ed Maybach says. If you want to change behavior, make it easy, fun, and popular. So we're going to try and make this easy, fun, and popular. So I wanted to show you another resource, because we talked yesterday about the health effects. And a lot of people said they weren't sure that it was a challenge to connect these things to their audience. So you can download this report again at my website under the resources. And what we did here was we took a very scientific report, the National Assessment on Climate Change and Health. And we broke it down. There are eight different categories by which climate change is affecting our health. And those are the eight at the bottom. And then we put them in the different regions so you could see you know, which are the most important in each region. So I'm not going to take a lot of time here, because you can download this report and you can read it yourself. It's very quick, because it's presented in very simple, clear terms. For each of the eight categories, we tell you what's happening to climate, how it harms our health, and who's most vulnerable. And then we tell a story. This is Isaac's story. That woman's a pediatrician. Isaac is her nine-year-old son who got taken to the hospital after football practice because of the heat. Now, you're not going to tell Isaac's story, but you'll tell somebody else's story. This will give you ideas for you to go deeper and find these stories in your own arena. I'm going to tell you a few more key resources. So I told you about the sheets at Sideline. Another thing Sideline does is they will find an expert for you. So if you don't have an expert to call on any given topic in science, you, you go on their website, Sideline.org, you tell them what you need on what topic and what your deadline is, and they will get back to you with a vetted expert, somebody who's a top scientist in the field who's also known to be a good communicator. They check this stuff out. And so they will help you with an expert, Sideline.org. I think everyone should know about the Yale climate opinion maps. So again, they're linked from my website, under websites, um, under resources. These things are really, really cool. And I'm going to show you ex an example of them in a minute. But what they do is they downscale the national public opinion data. And they show you for every congressional district, for every county, what Americans think about lots of different issues that are relevant to climate change about the science, about the solutions, about policies. It's very, very cool, very informative. Language tips, like the stuff I've been talking about at my website, you can see all these articles that I've written. Oh, myth debunking, let me not skip over that. We talked a little bit yesterday about the common talking points that come up over and over again. We call them the zombie myths, because they won't die, no matter how many times we kill them. But this website, skepticalscience.com, is a wonderful repository of all the top 100 talking points that you hear over and over again, people saying, it's the sun, it's natural, it's you know all that kind of stuff. Short, medium, and long answers for every one of those things. So very great website, don't miss it. Also has a debunking handbook, how to debunk so you don't actually inadvertently reinforce the myth. 
because one of the things we found is that sometimes by trying to debunk a myth, you can reinforce it by saying, you know, people say it's the sun, but it's really not the sun. And what people take away is it's the sun, you know, so you have to just be careful about that. But they have a whole handbook about that. So finally, I want to talk about what I call a side door. Some people will ask me, how do I talk to that person? Emily asked me this just earlier. How do I talk to that one person who is just so hardened against this? And it's, a, you know, it's coming from an ideological point of view. And one of my favorite ways to do that is by finding a side door. And that's because after 30 years of doing this, I decided that banging my head against a locked front door will only give me a headache, and it won't actually advance what I'm trying to do. So I find a side door. And to me, I'm going to give you a hint at a side door. Here's one of the Yale Climate Opinion Maps. So here's the question, who thinks global warming is mostly caused by human activity? And everything in blue, if you look at the scale, is less than 50 percent. And, and then, you know, it goes up yellow, orange, red. So this is not good. Most of the country is, you know, still thinks that climate change is not caused by human activity. We're at 53 percent of Americans who say it's caused by human activity. So you would think this is bad news. However, I'm going to show you a side door. If you ask them if they like funding research into renewable energy sources, boom, everybody does. Look at that. We're up at 83 percent. They like clean, renewable energy. Everyone does. So where you're facing that kind of ideological divide, where people just don't want to hear or believe that humans are causing global warming, maybe it's because they feel the finger pointed at them that it's their fault and they're to blame. I don't know what it, you know, we know some of the reasons. And here's another one. Do you support tax rebates for people who purchase energy efficient vehicles and solar panels? Love it. Everybody loves it, 81%. They're tax dollars. They want them spent that way. So the side door is clean energy clean, renewable energy. And I'm not the only one who thinks so. Justin Gillis wrote a piece in The New York Times saying, let's just change the subject. Let's stop talking about climate change. Let's start talking about the clean energy revolution. There are so many benefits to action on climate change that have nothing to do with climate change. Cleaner air, research, technological development, job creation, cleaner, healthier, walkable communities. We send less kids to the hospital with asthma. What's not to like, right? And, you know, I'm sure you've all seen that cartoon, you know, oh, what if climate change is a hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Lots of good reasons, lots of good reasons to do these things. This study in, in Nature Climate Change by Bain et al. in 2015 showed that people were motivated by all of these other benefits equally, whether or not they accepted the science of human-induced climate change. So this is really good news for us because it gives us side doors. Everybody likes solar panels. The Kentucky Coal Museum covered its roof in solar panels. Why did they do it? Not because of climate change. They did it because it saved them $8,000 a year. So this to me is a great story and you, you, all of you find your Kentucky Coal Museum. I am sure they are out there, the strange connections that you wouldn't think of. I'm going to tell you a story of two women in Georgia, okay? You would not think these two women have a lot in common, because that's Colleen Kiernan. She heads the Georgia Sierra Club. That is Debbie Dooley. She is the founder and head of the Georgia Tea Party. Now, you would not think that the Sierra Club and the Tea Party have much in common, but it turns out they both love solar energy. They love it for different reasons. Colleen Kiernan likes it because she's worried about emissions. Debbie Dooley likes it because everyone should be able to put solar on their roof if that's what they want to do. They should be able to sell it back to the utility and get a good price for it. So the Greens and the Tea Party have gotten together. They lobby the Georgia legislature. They do all kinds of things together, and they call themselves the Green Tea Coalition. <laughs> I love green tea. So my point is, strange bedfellows, just, you know, don't worry about it. Find those stories. They're great. They're exciting. And we see all over this country, Republican mayors, Republican governors, they're out there and they're doing this work because, not because of climate change, they're doing it because it's good for their economy. It's growing jobs, and they want to be part of the clean energy revolution. They want to see it benefit their state. So this may be a way in with a lot of people who are really resistant. 
So there are so many great stories on the solution side. I think one of the un undertold stories is community solar. Most people, when they hear about solar, they think, oh, I got to put $30,000 into a system and put it on my roof. What if I rent? What if I live in the woods? Community solar is this really cool thing that's available in many places. Not everyone knows about it. And you can just simply lease panels from your utility. And, you know, I do it where I live because I live in the woods. I pay $5 a month for each panel, and then they credit me back the energy that those panels have produced. So it's basically neutral for me. I don't actually pay more. And I'm all solar. And there's no contract, there's no maintenance, there's nothing to worry about. I think many people just don't know this story. So I'm just using this as one example. I don't, you know, I'm not getting paid to promote community solar. Just one example of the kind of story that I think is not well told, that's very under told. And even if community solar is not available in a place, if people know that it's an option, they can start bugging their utility and saying, we want community solar. That's what I plan to do when I move to Asheville because Duke Energy is there. And I shouldn't say any of this stuff on camera. <laughs> OK, I'm going to stop talking and take a few questions. And then we're going to move on to Sean and tell you more about Climate Matters in the newsroom and more great resources that we have for you. So thanks very much for your attention. OK, questions, challenges? Yes. I just want to amplify something you said at the very beginning. When you're seeing climate change stories with pictures of polar bears or kids in fountains or line of solar panels. I will bet you many dollars to your donut that you're seeing a stock image. Oh, yeah. Which means that we are not taking a photographer with us when we go out to try to cover these stories, which means we're letting our photography departments die. And if we are going to get those real people in these stories, we need the cameras. And we need to fight for the cameras, or we are going to have nothing but polar bears. And that's like bringing dandelions to your date. You're being a cheap ass fool. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Thanks. Good point. Excellent point. Questions, challenges? Doesn't anybody want to beat me up on the language stuff or anything? <laughs> yes. I think one of our challenges is let's just take wildfires in California, for example. I think it's really hard to say that wildfires are caused by, you know, human caused climate change. Nobody but, says that. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, you had a whole slide with, I think, nine paragraphs on it. And how do you simplify that in a way where you're saying, you know, climate change is enhancing, increasing? Not enhancing, that means making better. <laughs> you changed your, you edited yourself. Exactly. But I mean, it just, it's, I'm going to go I back to getting it. to the point quickly and making that point quickly while, you know, the public interest is in the families that are fleeing their homes and it's a news story. And we can do enterprise differently than in the heat of the moment and when it's emotion driven and people want those victim stories and all of that. So, how, I mean, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on how do you condense that, all those paragraphs, into one easy sentence or paragraph that really conveys the point, but then we can really use all of the other newly reported material to enhance or <laughs> enhance, the enhance the story. That's the good news. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I promise she's not a plant. The sentence she's asking for is the top line there. Human-caused climate change is a significant contributor to the increasing size and intense size and intensity of and damage from Western US wildfires. That's your sentence. You don't need to say any more than that. Climate change is a significant contributor. Nobody said it caused it. There are always lots of things. That's a single cause fallacy. There are always lots of things that cause any given event. There's never a single cause. So nobody says that. That seems like to me like a red herring that people say, oh, you're saying it caused it. No, nobody says that. Nobody that knows what they're talking about will ever say it caused this event. It's a contributor. And we know from all the stuff below, and the reason all that stuff is there below is not because you have to put it all in your story. It's to give you the confidence that that top line is correct, that it is a, cons a significant contributor. All those other facts, those other 10 paragraphs, they will give you the confidence that, yes, it is a significant contributor, and I can say that. So then if you're writing a story later that's not that emergency story right in the moment, you might have time for a little bit more. 
what is the role of climate change? What's the role of forest management? What are these other things? Should we be raking our forests now? Um, but you, you may want to do another story that has more. But I think that that simple top line, it's why we do the top line. What is it that you can and should say? The rest of it is support for that. As an editor, where in the story do you see that line? Is it in the top? Is it at the end? Is it after the first? So I prefer it's not at the end, because then it seems like an afterthought. This is a job for an editor, not for me. But what I would do is, after the first paragraph or two where you get the hot news right off the top, I would then say, you know, this, I, where I would put it is when you're talking about causes. So if you say this fire appears to have been started by a PG&E power line, or this particular fire seems to have been started by a careless camper, and then I would say, and human-caused climate change is a significant contributor too. So that's how I would do it. But that's you know that's up to each of you. So I hope that's helpful. All right, good, great questions. Okay, one, two, three. Are there any resources you'd recommend that help? journalists to um, rank the effectiveness of, of the solution. So, I mean, community, community solar, just as an example, like, so we had a policy from a politician yesterday who said just, yeah, solar panels, that's it, nothing else, we don't need to do anything, but like, you know, there's agriculture, there's industry, like, it, you know, but when we're writing about solutions, how do we kind of like frame that in a way that helps people understand the actual impact it will make? You know, how, how, what percentage of emissions does solar kind of Right, right. Yeah. So great question. There are a lot of good resources out there. Um, I have some of them, and I'm happy to share them. One new one is not that new anymore, called Drawdown. So you can, I think it may be projectdrawdown.org or something, but just Google Drawdown, Project Drawdown. They, they produced a book of the top 100 solutions for climate change, for reducing emissions and drawing down CO2 concentrations from the atmosphere. And it's a global story. So global is not going to be the same as it is for your place, but it's a place to start to begin to understand the percentages of where emissions come from. So, you know, roughly three quarters of the problem is, is fossil fuels, and other, the other quarter is agriculture, land use, and all of that. Um, and so drawdown, and it's starting to be downscaled in particular places. Last week, I was in Georgia, where they now have Georgia drawdown. They have looked at those 100, and they've said, what works for Georgia? Turns out 23 of those solutions are really good and workable for Georgia. And so now Georgia Drawdown is underway. It's a consortium of all the universities in Georgia working on exactly this question. So they can tell Georgians, this is what we need to do if we want to get to zero, if we want to get our net emissions to zero by the middle of the century. Because look, what the IPCC says is, you know, we need to cut our emissions in half by 2030. That's where the 12 years comes from and cut them to net zero by 2050 if we want to avoid crossing 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. So that's what the 11 years is all about. And so it was really hurt my heart to hear a 17-year-old say last night, we only have 11 years left. Like, yeah, we have 11 years left to cut our emissions in half if we want to keep you know, total warming to less than 1.5 degrees. It's, but it, I felt that inevitability thing, and it really worried me. Um, so. There are lots of other good sources. Um, a lot of the groups like uh, NRDC and you know the, some of the other green groups. There's a great group called Energy Innovation out in California that does really great work on the energy policy side. So they've looked at the policies that we would need to put into place to get us there. Because like, so one whole question is the technologies. Then a whole other question is the policies. What are the policies that will drive the, the in, implementation of those technologies? So energyinnovation.com uh, or .org. Um, so there's lots of good resources. I'm constantly looking for them, curating them, and putting them on my website, climatecommunication.org. So if you go there, you'll see some more. But it's a great question, and it's really important. Now I had two more over, two or three more over here. I've already forgotten. One is Mary, and then I'm over here. Go ahead. So. That seems like the quick facts seem like a, a great resource. I'm thinking of our last hurricane scare, and it's it's the long range is not top of mind when you're like, oh, I gotta tell people when they're getting out, when the evacuation, and oh my god, what am I gonna do with my dog, and right. you know everything right. like that. So that will be a great resource. How often are you gonna update it? And and is there something on there that says when it was last updated? We will do that. We will put that on there if it's not on there already. 
And you know, these things are always a, a question of time and funding. I got like a little tiny grant to make these happen. And um, I always try and keep stuff up to date, but it gets, it gets hard. My website is another example of that. I try to keep it up to date, but you know, in the midst of everything. So, but you're right, we should have on there when it was last updated. And I hope we will be able to keep updating them and also creating new ones because I think they really are an important resource for people. And even for people who use, are used to doing the deep dive, this is a good place to start. From here, you can do the deep dive. We've, we've identified a lot of the key papers for you. So the ones that I've, we've done so far are all pretty, very, pretty established science. The one on the cold snap was harder for me because it's still a very active area of research. The science on that is not settled. It has to do with the waviness of the jet stream and you know, some crazy scientific ideas that I don't even want to say the words because they're so nerdy, quasi-resonant amplification and stuff like that. But anyway, there's, there's really interesting science, but it's not completely settled. So I want to present it to you all in a way that's accurate and appropriate, that this is, we feel like we're seeing, the scientists are seeing a correlation and they understand some mechanisms, here are the mechanisms, but this isn't a done deal. This isn't nailed down yet. So we're working on that, though. OK, wow. There, there, and then there. OK. This was really interesting, this, uh, uh, what you have on the slide. And uh, there was a question of earlier about you know, how, where do we use that top line? Yeah. And I was thinking about that. And um, you know, some of us are not covering this from a national perspective, right? So you know, we're not writing about wildfires or we may not be in an area that's affected by hurricanes. Um, so if there's a way to you know, take that top line and those essentials and regionalize them or even state by state somehow, and, and you know, because that could be the segue, right? You know, for, you, you know, if you're trying to construct your story and you want to get that top line in there somehow, and you need, okay, well, I need to say there's been X amount of wildfires since, you know, in this time period. Um, that would be a much more useful segue that could get into that top line versus just sort of dropping it in there. Yep. Um, I think you're absolutely right. You all are the experts on where you live. And um, the National Climate Assessment, when we've done those, we've broken them down by regions so we could tell you about the southeast or the northeast. We didn't quite get down to the level of states, but they're working on that now. So the team at the National Centers for Environmental Information, the NOAA lab in Asheville, North Carolina, has put out some state fact sheets, state-based fact sheets that talk about the impacts by state. Um, they're not as developed as something like the full national climate assessment, but there are some good resources out there. There are state climatologists. There's a state climate office in every state. Most of them are pretty good. Some of them not so much. Um, you probably know what I'm talking about. and. Um, so there are state resources, you know, in the Carolinas right now, there's a great uh, consortium and this Georgia Climate Project is amazing. All the universities in Georgia have banded together in this Georgia Climate Project and they've got tremendous information on what's going on in that state. So you probably know what those resources are where you live. But those, it's, I totally agree. You always want to get it right down to where you are. Yeah. I'm going to have to stop soon. Should I take one or two more quick questions? Hey. Okay. Um, I just want to see some thank you for all these resources. Sure. And um, I just want to say I'm here this weekend to learn. But as like a network TV person, um, the, the way you started the presentation was a little rough. I'm sorry. It's OK. But I just want to say, because we're all journalists and facts matter, I just want to say, like, at ABC, we have environmental reporters and digital outlets, and we do a lot of standalone stories. And um, to cherry pick the, uh, like, when there's a hurricane and, like, the NICU is being evacuated or Susan's house is being burnt in a wildfire, we don't really, like, take the time to explain why it started. But I, understand. I just want you to know that this is, um, 
important to us. I understand, and I appreciate that. And I, I worried a little bit. I didn't want to be singling anybody out. And I was using Media Matters because I think they do a, you know, an interesting job of this. But I hear you. I also want to say that I have really good personal relationship at ABC News. Years ago, I spent most of my effort working with people at ABC News. Um, I knew Bill Blakemore very well, Clayton Sandell, who's now out in Denver, I know really well. Um, I was actually invited by the head of ABC News to come to headquarters in New York some years back and bring one person. I brought my colleague, Michael Oppenheimer, who's a wonderful scientist at Princeton. We went and we spent an hour at lunchtime with the folks at ABC News. We had a wonderful time. We had correspondents and anchors and producers in the room, and it was really great. And in fact, when the hour was over, nobody wanted to end, and we kept going for another 45 minutes. And I felt like I saw so much great coverage. Um, I know uh, Dan at, at Nightline and Dan Harris, he's terrific. And um, I would love to do more work with ABC News. I think it's a great team, and I think they do great work. So I appreciate you saying something, and I'm sorry. I, it's OK. I can take the royal baby jokes, like at dinner parties. But just since you guys are science reporters, I just wanted you to know, like, we're not doing zero stories. I know. I appreciate, I appreciate you bringing it up. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd love to have you back. Well, I'd like to come back. I'd love to talk more with ABC. Absolutely. I think you guys do a lot of great stuff. So thank you. Thanks for saying it. I guess I have to stop. Do I? I have to stop. Where's Sean? Is Sean here? Oh, he's right behind me. <laughs> fabulous job. <laughs> OK, we're stopping. I'm, I'm turning it over to Sean now. Do you know how to do this? I can do that. OK, do that. I'm uh, sorry. No, 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 no. Was fabulous. This is, <laughs> this is what it's all about, is continuing the conversation. Uh, and we're happy to do that. You, you mentioned uh, some of the resources, including skeptical science, which, uh, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, back in the day, uh, I was a former broadcast meteorologist. And I used uh, the skeptical science tool uh, ad nauseum. And the other beautiful thing about the skeptical science is that uh, there's an, literally an app for it. If you go to, to Google, uh, Google Play, and I believe it's on iOS as well. Um, so you can have that stuff in the palm of your hands when you need a quick response to something and you're away from your PC. Uh, the app is just called Skeptical Science. And uh, it's just fabulous. It's just fabulous. Uh, as Sue mentioned, my name is Sean Sublitz. I work at Climate Central. Uh, we're a nonprofit based in Princeton, New Jersey. A little bit about my background coming into here. Uh, I'm a meteorologist by training. I'm a Penn Stater. I very briefly wrote some code for a third party company at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center out of grad school, which sounds amazing, but it was boring as hell. So I decided to go back into operational forecasting. I worked on the air uh, in the Roanoke Lynchburg television market for about 20 years, uh, for eight years at the NBC, which was in Roanoke, then the following 11 at the ABC uh, in Lynchburg, in that split market. Then about five years ago, uh, I had this opportunity to, to take my career in a different direction, as they say, uh, and join the staff at Climate Central because you know I very much knew in my heart that this was a topic that was only going to grow in the national consciousness further and further. Uh, so I thought, you know, it was a, a good place to be. Uh, I do want to say thanks to MacArthur and Neiman for, for inviting us up here. And we don't do this in a vacuum. We work with Susan, uh, her organization, Climate Communication. But we have the blessing of the AMS, NASA, NOAA, and of course, we've alluded to, to Ed's um, group there, the George Mason Climate Center. Uh, Center for Climate Communication. So technically, with the legalese out of the way, who are we at Climate Central? An independent organization of scientists researching and reporting the facts about our cl changing climate and its impact on the public. That's, you know, that's the thing. You know, so there's me, there's Bernadette, our director. She was also a broadcast meteorologist for about 10 to 15 years. I sit across from our two data analysts. Our graphic artist is Caddy Quarter to me. We have two or three recent uh, Princeton grads as fellows who are helping write materials. Uh, so we're a small group on the fourth floor of an office building in Princeton, New Jersey, right across the street from the campus. Uh, just to pull back the curtain and give you a visualization of, of what it's like in there. Uh, we have three main programs at our organization. Uh, sea Level Rise Science, Partnerships Journalism, and my program, or our program, uh, Climate Matters. And Climate Matters is probably the most visual 
of all of these, but I do want to briefly touch on these other couple of programs. First being the sea level rise, and obviously this is a bigger issue in coastal markets versus those you may be coming um, you know, from Kansas or, or Wyoming or, or places that don't have a coastline. Um, these are maps that illustrate how much certain levels of sea level rise will impact a community. And it's not just the mapping, and I know it's tiny, so you can do this on your own time, but we also have, using census data, we can look at social vulnerability, population, ethnicity, income, property, and landmarks that are affected at different levels of sea level rise. For example, if we move with the water up five feet in Boston, uh, you can see that we actually lose a fair bit of Cambridge there. Uh, a lot of Logan goes underwater as well. And the user is you, can just go to this website, it's sea level.club at central.org, and use the little slider there on the far left and take one, two, three, all the way up to 10 feet, or three meters if you would prefer to do it that way. So you can generate reports um, about populations that are affected. We also have some more interesting visualizations. We work with Google Maps and a lot of the elevation data to give some kind of concept of what different amounts of warming slash sea level rise will look in different locations, not just across the country, but around the world. This is one we prepared about 18 months ago, actually, uh, looking at New York for four degrees Celsius of warming, which translates to about 29 feet of sea level rise. Now, remembering that it's not instantaneous, of course, we're already about one, almost 1 1.5, <laughs> all right, and we haven't seen that much sea level rise yet. But that's assuming once we get into an equilibrium state, because, you know, we're warming so fast, it takes a while for the ice to respond. Uh, that's the same reason you can have hail when it's 70 degrees outside. Ice doesn't melt instantaneously. So this is really uh, illustrates the difference between a 4C and a 2C warming on how it's gonna look um, in New York City, for example. So it, it's quite eye-opening, it's quite sobering, and it's visualization. It's not absolutely perfect right down to every single block, uh, but it's a fairly good idea of what we're kind of up against here as we go forward in the coming decades. Uh, the Partnerships Journalism, this is largely for uh, journalistic organizations that, that are struggling a little bit with resources. We have a couple of part-time reporters, and we have our main editor, John Upton, uh, will work together to cover a story. We provide the, the background data, and we'll work with you, your editors, uh, your staff, but you, will, uh, you provide, obviously, the local expertise in a situation like this. We've done stuff with NJ.com, um, as well as WJCT, the NPR, in, uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. <coughs> and uh, the Arizona Daily Star. Uh, and this is a relatively new thing. You know, some people are more comfortable with this than others, and that's fine, we get that. But if this is something you're curious about, I would encourage you to talk to our, our partnerships journalism editor, John Upton, uh, at jupton at climatecentral.org. So with that plug in for the rest of my office, let's talk about uh, what my little program is, Climate Matters. Um, this is a reporting resource program. And this kind of dovetails on a lot of the things that Sue was talking about. Uh, that helps meteorologists and journalists cover the science and impacts. And you know, impacts are important. Science and facts are important, but it's always what does it mean for me? What are the impacts? How does it affect me? And ultimately, we're doing more things about solutions as well, because you don't want to leave people hanging and just have them feel like there's nothing that they can do. So our team, which is the people that I discussed earlier, scientists, data analysts, and visual artists, identify and interpret data and produce text that helps you tell your story your way. Our job is to help you, not tell you how to tell the story. It's your story to tell. You know your audience is way, way better than we do, but we're here to help. Uh, those are some of the briefs that we have done here over the past few months. We average about one to two a month. Every Wednesday, we put out something. It's called Climate Matters or Climate Matters in the Newsroom or both. We have something that goes out every Wednesday. But normally about a couple of times a month, we do expand it to a much fuller, a fuller brief that's called Climate Matters in the Newsroom, which is more tailored towards journalists versus meteorologists. Because that's how the program started about 10 years ago. It was one meteorologist in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, Jim Gandy, who has since retired, and just a fabulous guy all around. Uh, these materials were prepped for him 
a couple of graphics, a large climate analysis, and then he would go on the air and do a longer form 60 or 90 second discussion of why a specific climate trend in Columbia, South Carolina matters to his audience, thusly Climate Matters, and the name has stuck with us uh, ever since. It's expanded very rapidly, and the program was open nationwide to people just a couple years afterwards, and we've got people in, in Idaho, uh, as well as South Florida, uh, as well as Phoenix, Arizona, and even in St. Louis, Missouri. And not every graphic we, we produce is some line going up. We do a lot of kind of infographics as well. <laughs> Look, um, the, when, I, when, I came, when I came to Climate Central in 15, our, our director of communications, he's a, he was a salty fellow. Uh, he's no longer with the company. He's kind of moved on to doing other things. But he would look at us and go, the important thing is that the line's going up. <laughs> you know, we're just, because we know intrinsically there are people who, who aren't paying that much attention. And you're not trying to mislead people, but you're trying to convey a short message. With the line's going up, that means you know, there's something going on. <laughs> All right. And look, some of our lines go down. I'm not going to fit to you. Some of the lines go down, but most times the lines are going up. Um, we can't account for every single solitary microclimate in the country, uh, but we don't hide the ones that do. I just chose not to show them here. Uh, <laughs> but again, we have the infographics like Amber shows there about what different emission scenarios mean for viable areas of land that grow coffee because everybody digs their coffee, all right? Um, the program also made a, a good effort. We, we don't do this as much as we used to. I would like us to do it more, but we'll see what Grant says. Um, to connect operational meteorologists to scientists. We had a very nice program up at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center about two and a half years ago. Uh, and you might even reckon, I know they're small, but there, there's some very, some good friends here. Jason Seminal from the Post. Pete Boucher, is Pete here? You're in there, you were there. Oh yeah, Pete was there. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's good. It's all good. Uh, you know, Joe Whitty was there. We had uh, Brad Panovich from Charlotte. Uh, so it was a very good, a very good group. Then we did get a new National Science Foundation grant, uh, which is what most of my salary is, uh, in 2017 to expand this to journalists. So we could took this concept of media of weather information, climate information to meteorologists, and then we kind of folded it in to something that was gonna be more tangible or more useful for journalists so that we could get this topic out of just the weather segment. Because for so long, oh, here's a, here's a climate change thing, give it to the weather person. You know, so you know, it was important that people understand that the impacts are beyond just the weather. So that's why we tooled this up and increased it to Climate Matters in the Newsroom. And some of you have already on board and we thank you very much. Uh, and we'll have everybody getting this stuff uh, at the end of at the end of the showcase uh, later on today. Um, but we've also entered a very good relationship with the local NBC affiliate in Washington D.C. and they're doing a very regular branded series uh, called Changing Climate. Same thing at NBC in Philly, uh, covering the climate. So we're very happy to see uh, that the program is expanding and the discussion continues to move forward. With that in mind. Uh, we now have 790 media meteorologists. I say media because there's about 40 or 50 of these that are working almost exclusively online, uh, and 330 journalists. And that, and I compiled, I, I'm in charge of compiling that number, uh, and I could do it every day, but I, that I'd get very tired, so I compile it at the end of every month. So that's, that's our total uh, at the end of October. So when we send these emails out on Wednesdays, what do they look like? Uh, the, the climate matters in the newsroom, which is what, what I think that, you know, you're most interested in. We have some kind of general topic, and we try to keep it very timely or seasonal. Uh, for example, this is one we sent out in the middle of August uh, about heat and summer sports, because this is when football practices start in August, when it's still crazy hot outside. So one of the things we looked at here was extreme heat. We looked specifically at the heat index in this situation, since so the body response to that, a little more than just the, the immediate ambient temperature. So, and to your point about localizing data, this is one of these situations where we localize as much as possible when we can. Every single one of these releases isn't going to have localized, 
but we do it whenever we can. In this particular case, it was Boston. We were able to get good humidity data back to 1979 because you have to have the humidity data to put together a heat index. Uh, so over the course of the last 40 years, on average in Boston, there's about six more days that uh, your heat index is over 90 degrees. And obviously these are ups and downs. That's the weather uh, versus climate, which is a longer term trend. You know, and we kind of key up a couple of key concepts. For example, climate change impacts being felt throughout the world of sports uh, because they need to protect athletes and spectators during extreme heat. So that's kind of a, you know, the top line or introductory kind of, kind of finding. Uh, at the top there, you see view report download data. Those are things that are hot linked. If you go to look at a, a bigger report that we do that accompanies this little climate matters in the newsroom brief, or if you want to download the data yourself, if you don't particularly care for the way we we display the data, or maybe your, your publication or organization requires that it be in a certain typeface or look in your, in your uh, general look, uh, you can download the data and put the thing together yourself. That's fine with us. We just appreciate if you say Climate Central provides us the data. Um, and a little bit more about how we came together with, with how the story came together. Uh, the bottom bullet here I thought was probably the, the most important thing was that according to the CDC, heat illness is the leading cause of death or disability for high school athletes, uh, which is a very, very big deal as I think we've all seen. Uh, and then if you're looking for additional story angles, we have, have other ideas uh, to pass along. You can go back and look at local temperature records set around the country or look at interactive maps. So these things are all hot links, so you can go to other, <laughs> other resources. We're just kind of trying to lead you to resources that are going to help you tell the story in your markets. All right, how does your state compare when it looks to safety policies? Um, it's a good idea. You could check with the league softball or baseball teams. Call your high school athletic directors, your college athletic directors. So we're just kind of saying, you know, here's an idea. Here's an idea. We know this is in the news. We know this is topical. Here are some thoughts. Here are some directions you might want to go if you're on deadline. And we also, as uh, in concert with the sideline stuff, we provide experts who have agreed to be interviewed. We check ahead of time. We let them know that this thing is going out. And uh, we say, hey, is it all right if people call you, email you for comment? And they all agree to it. Um, so we try to package that up nice and neatly on, on Wednesdays. And normally this goes out 11 a.m. Wednesday morning, Eastern. Sometimes 10 if things are going well. Sometimes noon if they're not going well. Um, so you know, these are a few more examples that we've done. The bottom line is we're trying to support you telling the story your way and for your audience, because we can't be all things to all people. All we can do is kind of help. You know, we lead, we like to lead you to the water, then you drink as much as you would like, as they say. Um. <laughs> That's your side. <laughs> really? Yeah. Hmm, I need to talk to our webmaster. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, because like every story is different, you know, coastal flooding, Atlantic City, wildfires in the Intermountain West or, or, uh, you know, or sea level, all, all that stuff is different. Uh, a couple of examples, these are broadcast, um, broadcast examples. And this is just, just about a week or so ago uh, from our friend Jacob, who's on the other side of the state at the ABC in Springfield. Meteorologist Jacob Weinkoff talked to several local farmers on the difficulties of farming nowadays. Jacob joins us now with more on that. Jacob? Farming is under increased pressure to produce more crops in a healthier and more sustainable way. This comes as an estimated 50% of all human-made methane, a dangerous greenhouse gas, comes from producing rice and raising cattle. So what is the state of our local farms and how are they dealing with the changing climate? Farming isn't just a way of life for Harrison Bardwell. You can say it's in his DNA. Bardwell is a ninth generation farmer here in Hatfield. His land has been in the family since 1685. Being here for so many years or having heritage of so many years going back uh, kind of feels like we're connected with the soil and with the earth here. The Connecticut River Valley has some of the best soil in the entire world. Still, Farming is not easy, and the changing climate makes it even more difficult in recent years. Heavy winds and flooding um, is just constant now. It's not, I don't, 
I don't remember the last time we got a nice steady rain for a whole day. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, recently reported, with the increase of greenhouse gases, there's a high correlation between human-induced climate change and heavy precipitation or flooding events. That means for every one degree Fahrenheit in temperature rise, the air can hold 4% more water vapor. It's something that isn't lost on Bardwell. Um, sometimes Mother Nature wins. Agriculture is an important part of our economy here in Massachusetts, uh, and I'm a big believer that we ought to support our local farms. U.S. Representative and member of the Agricultural Committee, Jim McGovern. Flooding, um, you know, uh, diseases that have impacted plants, um, you know, even the challenge of raising cows uh, has become much more complicated and difficult because of climate change. McGovern goes on a yearly tour around Western Mass to gauge what is impacting farmers. Lately, there has only been one thing on their minds, the changing climate. The scientists have told us, you know, in, a, in the most clear way possible, that climate change is real and that we need to do something about it. We have one planet. I mean, let's be good stewards of our environment. Western Mass News caught up with Matt Mahar, the co-owner of Poplar Hill Farm in West Waitley, during a recent visit with McGovern. Farming is a challenge every day. That's just the way it is. If the weather keeps changing, you learn how to do things under those conditions. Farming in general is adapting constantly to, so you just adapt. You have to. You adapt or die. Who knows what the next 20, 30 years is going to bring us? Who knows what man's going to develop between now and then to, to help us with climate change? And both farmers I spoke with mentioned they use regenerative agricultural techniques like using cover crops, rotating their crops on their land, and going with a zero-till planting. These farmers are making changes on a local level and hoping they gather traction internationally. In the studio, meteorologist Jacob Wyckoff. So I really like what Jake did there in his tag about showing what solutions were. These are what the farmers are already doing. And everybody loves a good farmer story. I mean... I was in TV news for 20 years. Everybody likes a good farmer story. Um, so I thought Jake did a really good job uh, with that. This one is, is down in Carolina. Uh, Amy Wilmoth was another meteorologist uh, still down there at the NBC WRAL. And this one was about mosquitoes. Whoopsies. I always hate it when that happens. Go on back. This, uh, <clears throat> this one was about mosquitoes. <laughs> Mosquitoes, annoying bloodsuckers that have extended their stay. In fact, Durham and Raleigh rank in the top five cities with the fastest growing mosquito season. My name is Luann Cartano. It's so miserable getting bit. <laughs> Just makes me want to cut the play session short. <laughs> See. According to Climate Central, an independent agency that researches climate change, the Triangle now has 41 more days of mosquito season compared to the 1980s. You know, for mosquitoes, it's just the females that take blood. Dr. Michael Reiskind, a professor at North Carolina State University, studies and collects mosquitoes for his research and says the time of year for collecting mosquitoes really doesn't matter anymore. One big change is that in the last several years, we started trapping year-round. And the reason? Warmer temperatures and more rain. Since 1970, temperatures in the Triangle have increased by 3.3 degrees. And yearly rainfall has increased more than two inches. And while mosquitoes might keep you from enjoying your front porch, there are bigger concerns. Mosquitoes can also transmit diseases. Ideal conditions for mosquitoes to transmit diseases are temperatures between 61 and 93 degrees. Disease danger days have increased 15 days since 1970 for the Triangle. In general, and certainly over like a large geographic area, warming temperatures probably puts more people at risk of disease transmission than, than we've seen before. Amy Wilmoth, WRL News, Raleigh. Trust him, he's a doctor, <laughs> as they say. Uh, so, yeah, and obviously some of our material is in there, too, and we're very grateful for that. But those are a couple of examples uh, of, of how this stuff is being used. Um, as they say, business is good um, for us. You know, getting off the ground a while back took a little time, uh, but in the last three or four years, as the conversation continues uh, to ratchet up uh, on climate change, we've seen the use of, of our products uh, going up dramatically. Uh, and these are all individual documented uses of, of Climate Central slash Climate Matters material. Uh, television, uh, specifically a hit that was on television or cable, uh, we've already exceeded all of last year. 
Um, when we say social and digital, we mean something that somebody tweeted out, somebody that they put on their professional Facebook page, or something that appeared uh, as an online piece or on their online online website. Uh, excuse me, on their online TV site. Their TV site has a web uh, has a website. Uh, and that's just through September, because it takes us about four or five weeks to catalog all these things. We've got a third-party system, a third-party organization called IQ Media uh, that helps us with this, and it, it helps a lot. Because self-reporting, while I'm always grateful when somebody lets me know that they used it, uh, it you know, we, we, it's not something we can really count on. Uh, so briefly about our media library. Uh, once we put out these emails, they show up in your email box. And by the way, if you sign up and you don't get them, please check your spam filters because they've been known to get in there. Or, or worse, sometimes a corporate filter will filter out our messages. So if you've ever signed up and you stop getting them, it's not like we've done anything differently, let me know and we'll find some solutions around that. Uh, but you, you go to our media library uh, and basically, it's, <laughs> I think about this as, as the old AOL days where you search by keyword. Um, whether it's something like heat, rain, flooding, tropic, something like that. Uh, and that will pull up a, a list of, of our materials. If you're in a hurry and there's one topic you want to see all of our material on, we all have these collecting what we call extreme weather toolkits. Uh, heat, drought, fires, tropics, heavy rain, coastal flooding. The content is all kind of housed there together. Uh, and then if you do have some more time, and we know time is of the essence, and you want to go back and learn about some topics, we do several webinars every year, on average about seven or eight uh, webinars a year for like kind of continuing education things. And then everything is archived here as well. Um, once a month, for example, uh, NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, puts out a national and a global temperature analysis for the previous month. You know, we pull back the curtain on how's that done because well, they're, you know, they're cucking the data or or what's what's the term, Sue? Uh, manipulation? Yeah. Well, they're manipulating the data, which sounds you know kind of like bad, but no, they're making corrections to bad data so that it doesn't look horrible. In fact, Deke Arndt, who's the director of the monitoring branch there, when I was talking to him, he said, you know, the corrections we make for the data uh, actually skew colder. <laughs> Um, rather than, than warmer. Uh, and inside climate models, what are climate models all about? We hear so much about the climate models. What are these? And these are not high highfalutin scientific presentations. These things are made for more general audiences, journalists, and most meteorologists don't understand how climate models work. Because I hear them say, well, our weather models aren't as good either. I'm like, we're, we're actually simulating two different things, but we'll talk about that some other time. Uh, real briefly, before we get to the Q&A, um, we do have a cool tool uh, that we've put together called Weather Power. This is generally for our meteorologists, but anybody is welcome to use this. Uh, we worked an organization in Albany, New York, called Mesosystems, uh, to develop an algorithm that takes the installed renewable power, uh, was it wind turbines or solar, that's already in place and operating. We look at that and then we look at gridded forecast data. Pete, this would be the GFS. Um, and then make a determination on how much electrical power was generated in a specific geography. For example, I pulled this late last night for, for Massachusetts and these are the numbers that came out. So solar power generated with current installations could power 10% of the homes in the state of Massachusetts. It doesn't mean that 10% are being generated by solar, but enough solar is being generated and we could plot this up at megawatt hours, but that kind of goes over everybody's head. Um, but it's about 10%. We have a, a daily cost saved. In other words, if you had an average solar array on your home and you have an average size home, because you have to make a certain amount of assumptions, you would save about 78% on your daily electricity cost. So if you spent $10 a day, uh, you'd save 780. All right, and then we have what we call the solar power index, which is very analogous to the ultraviolet index. We're just looking at uh, essentially how suitable is the day to generate a solar energy. And we have this for wind as well, but in the interest of time, we'll just kind of uh, continue on. Uh, here are a few more of the resources um, that um, I wanted to mention in addition to the ones that Sue brings up. Um, we talked yesterday about how 
Everybody trusts NASA. NASA has a fabulous, fabulous climate site, climate.nasa.gov. NOAA is the one that produces those, those monthly temperature analyses. NASA does it too, and they're slightly different, and I can talk offline about why they're a little bit different, because sometimes that happens. And a good place to start off is the National Climate Assessment uh, that came out in two phases in 17 and 18. Uh, some of you might have had a hand in that. I know Sue did, um, looking at both science and impacts. Um, and briefly, we have a, a little thing we put together a few weeks ago. It kind of showcases some of the work that's already been done uh, regarding climate change reporting. And we've had some very strong people doing this, including Mary Landers at Savannah. Mary, could you come up for just a real Sorry. brief second before we get the Q&A rolling? Um, because Mary kind of jumped into this very early on with us. Um, and if you would just say one or two wonderful things, it'd be great. Or lie and say we're horrible, whatever you like. So why I jumped into this early was I guess I got an email. I work a little bit with Cyline, so maybe that's why I got the email. Anyway, I got an email, and it had the, the link to one of the um, Climate Matters stories. It, it was one about... I'm not even sure. I've, I've done a couple that are about things like um, the increase in the, the overnight temperatures. And the thing that really drew me in was they have, you know, go, go, click on your state. And so, you know, everybody wants to see what's happening in their state. And I click on Georgia. And then there's a pull down menu, and Savannah was there. I could localize it to Savannah, and I kind of whooped out loud. I was just so excited that, you know, I could localize it that way because otherwise it's just not that useful to me. Um, I was telling Candace, I, Georgia is a big state, and I get a lot of information that is. You know, hey, come to our workshop luncheon, or you know, come to our PR luncheon tomorrow in Atlanta. Well, Atlanta's four hours away, and my readers don't care about what's happening <laughs> in Atlanta. So to have it localized at at the Savannah level was great, and I have used it repeatedly. Thank you. And here's an example, real quick. You go, you go to the media library. You know, I just type in cold, hit search. That would be the way I recommend doing it. Don't, don't fret too much about market and stuff. And there's something that's quasi-relevant, shorter cold spells, because it's cold. And sometimes people get, oh, it's cold, it's not global warming. <laughs> um, Y'all know how that goes. Y'all know how that goes. Um, so you just scroll down, and then you can pull your city. You know, we have it sorted by state. So let's go down, I-J-K-L-A-M. L-A-M, I said L-A-M. Um, Massachusetts, Boston, apply. So this is back to 1970, and this particular graphic, we're looking at consecutive winter days below normal. What was the longest stretch of days in a row that were below normal? Normal here is the 1981 to 2010 NCEI. So you see there a, a downward trend in those consecutive cold snaps. Cold snaps aren't as long lasting as they generally used to be. That's kind of the, the idea here. Uh, and then again, we have some of the narrative structure below that and the methodology. And if you want to jump up far, jump farther, some more other stories that you can kind of dovetail off of that one. Uh, we are running low on time. I wanted everybody initially to kind of put together some ideas, but Sue, we're, we're, we're getting close to the bottom of the hour. So rather than that, I want to just try to bring this, I want to have question and answer real quick um, because we didn't get to finish. I want everybody to have their questions answered as much as possible. Pete, go. Just a ringing endorsement of Sean and his team over at uh, Climate Central that are really willing to work with you. On, on our particular case, NBC is really particular about how it's presented on air and whether or not you have a banner there, and Sean was able to get the banner off, so we put our NBC banner on and customize it, still have his stamp, so. Yeah, th those graphics, you know, we produce them with or without a title, and with or without a background. So if you want, like, if you have some, you know, graphical capabilities, you want to use your own graphical look with a different background, we have these with transparent backgrounds. Um, so I can get with you on that and, and, and let you know how to do that. Yes, sir. I, I just want to thank both you and Sue for the really inspired work you're doing to make the you know, really good data available, but also thank your funders 
uh, that make your work possible. I know that without funding, uh, work is not possible. Uh, and offer, Amen. Yeah, and, and offer a shameless plug, which I neglected to do yesterday. An additional resource for all of you is c2es.org. We got lots of great basic information on science and impacts and emissions and emission sources and technologies. Of course, our forte is policy. Uh, we've got some great uh, state maps showing the different types of policies already being implemented at the state level. Uh, always happy to uh, uh, answer your questions on any of those matters, but again, uh, policy is, uh, is our bread and butter. Yeah, and that's one thing we're very strict about doing, about staying out of, uh, to be nonprofit and to try to work with as many people as possible. We do not advocate. We do not get into policy. We do discuss solutions, but our job is to hear the solutions. We're not saying you should do this one or do this one, but here they are. Please take a look at them. Uh, so that's kind of our, our idea there. So what other, what other questions? Oh, it wasn't that good. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Is, if if for those you have, oh no, go ahead. I just have a question um, about the weather power. Yes. I thought that was really fascinating, and I wondered um, kind of what was the idea about putting that together as a resource and then sure. sort of like, I mean, is it, you know, how could it help? You know, kind of how, in what ways could it help in your reporting? The the general idea was to make as as we've said, we want to kind of normalize this conversation. It needs to be kind of in the everyday conversation, and this was a good opportunity to do that. You know, this is mostly, again, aimed at meteorologists. If, if your local weathercaster, meteorologist, will sometimes say, well, here's the golf forecast, or here's the resort forecast, here's the bus stop forecast, well, here's the, here's the renewable energy forecast. And this is something that could be kind of peppered in on a very regular basis. Um, again, this, this one just happens to be solar because I think this is something that's a little more tangible for the viewer. Oh, if I put solar panels in my house, what would happen? And this, and again, it isn't perfect. There are a lot of assumptions that have to be made, to be sure, because everybody's house is different, everybody's solar angle is different. You know, solar is, is a little different in northern Maine as it is in South Florida, just because of the angle of the sun. Um, but the idea here being, it gives us a chance to normalize the conversation, get it into the conversation on a very regular, everyday basis. Mm -hmm. Do you have resources to create a kind of vulnerability index for a community? So yes. They, the, now, that's mostly for the sea level rise, coastal communities. We don't have that as, as much for inland communities because our, our key there is, is the sea level rise program when we're looking at those kinds of coastal populations. But I, I would argue that the, the National Climate Assessment is probably a very good place to start with that. Yes. Yes, um, you know, we're getting close to the bottom of the hour. Please take a look at it if you have your PCs with you. I think some of this is even works on, on phones. Um, but take a look. You know, I'm here for the rest of the day, uh, and we'd love to hear what you think uh, about it, uh, what kind of ideas it gives you and to do a story for your backyards. Um, and you can go online very easily and sign up, or you can just e oops, hey now. Uh, or you can just go, yeah, that's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> you can just contact me. Uh, there's my contact information. Uh, I'm, I tried to be very, there we go, very responsive on Twitter more than emails, because we all know how emails go. You turn around, next thing you know, you got 20 emails. Um, but I am on Twitter, DM me on Twitter. My DMs are open for this reason. Uh, as Mama used to say, don't abuse the privilege. Um, but my DMs are open. If you if you need something from us in a hurry, hit me up that way, as my daughter says. Um, there are also lots more video examples of, of individuals using this at our Climate.Matters Facebook page. You can just scroll through and see how people from across the country are using the products to get another idea on, on how you might want to incorporate it. Uh, so that's something I hope everybody takes some time to do, maybe do it during the break, during lunch, something like that. Uh, I'm here to the balance, for the balance of the, of the, or, of the tour, I guess. Um, so please, please come see me and, and we can chat. I've got business cards. And also one other thing, which is right there. You might have seen the buttons. 
uh, we have swag. <laughs> These buttons show the global average temperature every year since 1850, relative to normal. So the blue lines are showing colder than normal, the orange and red is hotter than normal, and this is going forward in time. Each year is the globally average temperature. I got buttons, come get buttons. Uh, and with that, that, with that it's at the bottom of the hour. Uh, so thank you, everyone.